Hello, hello, hello. Yes, I've got pollen in my throat. <clears throat> so I have my tea nearby. Was out on the street, gave away both Bibles I had with me. My friend Rose came to be with me the last part of the preaching. And then we went and looked at the property that I keep holding in prayer before God. Or maybe a church one day. Anyway, so we had a good time. It's glorious day outside. Wonderful sunshine and blue sky and um, getting warm. Today, we're going to look at Matthew 20. We're doing the stories that are unique to Matthew, the parables that are unique to Matthew. And today we're in the one in Matthew 20. And I didn't get my Bible open, but that gives you a chance to open yours. Matthew 20 is where we have our story for today. It is such an uh, encourager for me to be preaching the word out there on the street. People come by and say hi and come to get Bibles. <clears throat> Matthew 20, verses 1 through 16, and let us pray first. O oh Lord God in heaven, we honor you and praise you because you sent Jesus and because you made a record of his life here on earth. And therefore, we have stories. I ask that you will bless us now as we read and help us to understand. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew 20. Verses 1 through 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man who is a householder, who went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And said to them, Go you also into the vineyard, and whatever is right, I will give you. And they went their way. Again, he went out about the sixth and ninth hours, and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle, and said to them, Why do you stand here all the day idle? They said to him, Because no man has hired us. He said to them, go also into the vineyard, and whatever is right, that's what you will receive. <clears throat> so when evening was come, the Lord of the vineyard said to his steward, call the laborers and give them their hire, beginning from the last to the first. And when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more. And they likewise received every one a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the good men of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and you have made them equal to us, which have borne the burden and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a penny? Take what it is and go your way. I will give to this last, even as unto you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with my own? Is your eye evil because I am good? So the last will be first and the first last. For many be called but few chosen. That's Matthew 20, verses 1 through 16. We're studying the parables that Matthew especially chose. Parables recorded by Matthew and no other gospel writer. Parables in Matthew begin at Matthew 13, along with Jesus' rationale for using parables. The first three parables highlight the phenomenal growth potential of God's kingdom and are included in other gospel records besides Matthew. Parables 4 through 7 are unique to Matthew. 
and they are about how things work in God's kingdom. They were given to the disciples alone and not to the crowds. Parables 4 and 7 highlight inclusion and inclusivity as the stance of believers as they wait for the coming of Jesus, when the angels instructed by God will make the final sort for true justice and fairness. Parables 5 and 6 shape the idea of inclusion and inclusivity to show that some things will be sorted and dropped as believers concentrate their investments of time and energy toward what Jesus was bringing. Other parables are scattered throughout Matthew, three more being unique to Matthew, especially chosen by Matthew. The first of these, the king with an indebted servant, shows how forgiveness is imperative in policies of inclusion and inclusivity. Yet this parable also shaped our ideas of inclusion and inclusivity for those we have forgiven. The second parable, the man hiring workers, will teach us more about God's policies of inclusion and inclusivity. The third parable, the man with two sons and a vineyard to work, will show how some exclude themselves from the blessings of working with God. Now, the parable of the man hiring workers. The setting of this parable is that they had been talking about wealth in money and possessions. Jesus had reiterated that a believer has to give up dependence on wealth in order to follow him. The disciples felt approved, seeing that they had given up everything to follow Jesus. Yet they were worried about their reward. I imagine Jesus looked at them with love when he told them, Oh, you will be rewarded 100 times as much as what you left, but not in the ways you might expect. First and last often trade places. Now, hear the parable. Heaven's kingdom is like a man who goes to the marketplace early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agrees with those he hires for the going rate of pay for a day and sends them off to work. About 9 a.m., he sees more potential workers and tells them to go into his vineyard and he will pay them what is right. About noon and again at 3 p.m., he does the same. About 5 p.m., he finds others standing around and asks them why they stand around all day without work. They answer that no one has hired them. The man sends them into the vineyard, too, with no mention of pay. About 6 p.m., the man tells the manager that it is time to pay the workers and that he should pay the last workers first. He pays them a regular day's wages. This is why the workers hired first expect more and are disappointed and grumble at the man that he had made those who worked only a little equal with those who had worked much longer and under harder conditions. Friend, said the man, I have no malice toward you. I met the terms of our agreement. Take your pay and go. I choose to give the last worker the same as you. It breaks no law for me to do what I want with my own money. Does your envy grow in my generosity? <clears throat> in Matthew's earlier parables, the largest view was the field or the sea. In his later parables, the largest view is often the vineyard. Old Testament sources compared Israel to the Lord's vineyard, an easy association for Jesus' hearers to make. It looks like Jesus was looking for people to work among his own people, Israel. Some Christians feel empowered to seek their own church 
or the great unbounded church in the world as their place of work. By extension, I think that today we could say Jesus wants believers to work for him wherever they are in the wide world. The Jews who heard this, including his disciples, would have noticed the reference to the Jewish leaders. We can notice here the blazing theme of inclusion and inclusivity. The man took special effort to find those hired by no one else, those on the margins, those who may have smelled bad or limped or talked too much. No shame came from him that they should have been in the marketplace earlier or that some of them were known scoundrels. Everyone who made himself available was included in the commission to go to work. Not only that, but everyone was included in the equal pay scheme. There is no exclusion in any form here. However, those paid last and only a day's wage felt excluded from the bounty, not having received more and seeing those paid first were paid more than their hours authorized. The man in the parable explained himself that there was no exclusion here and that he had the right to do with his own money what he wanted to do with it. Similarly, if God has the same right, we should not be surprised if we cannot direct God's hand or shame God for God's choices. The first and last often trade places when least expected. My sense of fairness has a problem with this parable and its indiscriminate generosity. This was obviously not equal pay for equal work. One might claim it provided equal opportunity for the worker to begin the next day. But we do not know how big a family each man had or how many debts he was shuffling. This was not even equity, seeing no in inquiry was made into past traumas, setbacks, or closed doors that created need or lack. This pay was according to neither merit nor equality nor need. This was wild and astonishingly generosity. Deal with it, my intellect says to my feelings. One best way to deal with it is to decide to be in the marketplace early, every day, so as to be hired by this man and learn his practices. This is the way I hope I will choose. However, some other methods tug at me. On the one hand, I could decide to hide from him until the last hour tomorrow to get paid again at an outrageously high rate. Yet, obviously, I cannot know for sure if he will come at that last hour tomorrow, and neither can I know if his pay scale will be the same tomorrow. On the other hand, I could decide to protect myself and never work for that man again or never let my expectations fix on anything again, especially not on fairness. Yet this man seems so kind and reasonable, so unreasonably inclusive, that I am drawn to him and I want to work for him, disappointments and all. The parable of the man hiring laborers or workers teaches again about inclusion and inclusivity and how the most astonishingly generous inclusive action can leave some feeling left out. 
We are to work for inclusion and inclusivity anyway. Any study about inclusion in the Old Testament would not be complete at all without a look at the story of Ruth, which would have been in the background knowledge of Jesus' hearers. Some scholars think that Ruth might have been written after the Jews returned from Babylonian captivity as a counterweight to Nehemiah's strict policies of exclusion and with reference to, to David's grandparents merely thrown in for legitimization. Others think it could have been written near David's time as testimony to God's ways of working with people. Either way, the impact is huge of the inclusion of Ruth in Israel and in David's genealogy, as well as the genealogy of Christ. The story starts a long time before Ruth. Moab and Ammon were cousins to each other, and distant cousins to Israel, born of incest to a relative of Abraham. Their names are often said together in the Bible. When Israel came out, up out of Egypt and then in from the wilderness, descendants of Moab and Ammon occupied a large area east of the Jordan River. Moab did not welcome Israel back to its ancestral land, and instead hired a diviner to cast a curse on them, though God overruled in that case. Because of this, Moses ruled that a descendant of Moab could not become a part of Israel until the 10th generation. Moabites were shunned for years, not to be included. It was about time when a 10th generation might be living that Ruth, Ruth was born. And I think God wanted to show everyone that the ban was lifted and a Moabite could be included. A famine came to Bethlehem. Elimelech with his wife Naomi and two sons, Malan and Kilian, crossed the Jordan River into Moab to stay a while until the famine would abate. Plans to return were crossed out or at least complicated by the death of Elimelech. Naomi was a widow with two children in a foreign land. When the boys grew up, they fell in love, each with a fine Moabitess. <clears throat> How Naomi must have mourned her country and relatives though her daughters-in-law, Ruth and Orpah, tried to make it up to her. Then, Malan and Killian died also. Now, there were three widows of Israelite men trying to make it in Moabite land. Finally, Naomi, <clears throat> hearing that food was available back home, determined to return and live the widow's life of poverty among her own people. When she told the daughters, they both determined to go with her. They loved her so much. Naomi said, no, they must go back to their families. She knew the kind of shunning the Moabite girls could expect back in Bethlehem. No, the girls must return from following her. Orpah turned back, but Ruth would not. She was determined to assimilate to Naomi's people and even to Naomi's God. Naomi walked slowly in her age and grief. Ruth walked along beside her, carrying the bags with a naive sense of adventure. The welcome home was saddened by the deaths, 
Ruth wanted to go right to work to help put food on the table. The work allowed to widows was that of picking up the grain left in the field after the reapers went through. Determined to assimilate, she went to the field the next morning. The rest is a love story by which Ruth got a rich landowner husband named Boaz. Naomi got a family and the baby born was destined to be the grandfather of David, who would be king in Israel and ancestor of Jesus. In Jesus' day, when Matthew wrote his gospel, he carefully gave the extended male lineage of Jesus. And beside Boaz's name, he wrote Ruth's name. Only one of four female names included in that lineage. Never again will anyone say that Ruth was to be shunned because of her Moabite heritage. God included her. God showed out as God of all people, inclusive. So I want to pray for us. God's love astounds me. Let's pray. Almighty Father, we come to you honoring you because you, you work past all the rules and shunning that humans uh, put in place, even if they were put in place at your bidding. Oh Lord, you are the one who can make things happen. So we honor and praise you today as the king of the universe. And we apologize. We ask your forgiveness for the times when we have not accepted others. We, <clears throat> we request your forgiveness for when we have shunned others or when we have actively hurt others. Lord, help us to learn better ways. Help us to learn how our ways hurt others. And for right now, we're coming to you asking your forgiveness. And in the joy of that forgiveness, we recognize that you see not us in our inept state, but you see Jesus now when you look at us. That is astonishing to me. And in the joy of that forgiveness, we come to you with our requests. We ask that you will clean up our lives where we have had envy or um, jealousy in, in light of your generosity. Oh, Lord, fill us with yourself. Let us work with you in your vineyard. Hire us every day that we will learn how to live like you. We have our prayer requests. There are families who are missing a loved one to death. How we long that your spirit would comfort them and that Jesus would return soon so we can all be reunited in you. And Lord, I ask for your blessing for those who are short on resources or for those who are ill or recovering. I ask for your blessing on those who are estranged for some reason, family or work situation, and on our children especially. Please, Lord, walk with our children. Grant them courage. Take away their fear. And Lord, we also recognize that there is so much suffering in our world today that it's hard to name them all but there are wars everywhere and there are natural disasters fires and floods and volcanoes and tornadoes how we plead 
that you, by your spirit, will walk with each person who suffers. And as they call on your name, O Lord, work your mighty miracles for them. We thank you for that. Sometimes I feel horribly impotent in the face of all the suffering around. And yet, Lord, you, you can be there. So teach us to work in your vineyard with you and to learn of your ways. And one day we will be praising you in heaven. We will give you all the dominion, the power, and the glory forever. We've asked it in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm Wilma Zalabach. I'm with Grace Chapel Fellowship, which is a church to bless other churches, where listening is our unity. And I have a few themes that always come to the surface. One, God is good. Two, humans have been taken away from good. Three, Jesus came to bring us back. And four, I can't do it. God can. And so I decide to let God. Two more. The Bible is worth reading. And the Sabbath is a gift worth remembering. And now, until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you.